Welcome everyone, my name is Nomi. I'm here with uh, my co-host George and John and our guest Dr. Kurt Johnson. Um, we are really honored to have Dr. Kurt Johnson. Uh, he has background in science uh, as well as uh, in spirituality and he is currently uh, teaching uh, integral theory uh, at different institutions and he has been in the monastic life for more than 10 years and also uh, the acclaimed author of uh, Nabokov's Blues. Uh, I will uh, give it to Kurt Johnson but with one question that how did this uh, transition take place and what was the difference in the two domains that you experienced? Over to you. Yeah well first what I want to do is just um, just give you a little bit of a background of what my particular path has been because it really kind of shows actually also on the worldwide level how this discussion is developing mm -hmm. between really the the objective experience and the subjective experience if we just wanted to throw those terms out so I did start out as a Christian contemplative for 14 years in the monastic life mm -hmm. and um, during that time I worked closely with uh, brother Wayne Teasdale mm -hmm. who was a Roman Catholic monk who wrote a book in 2000 that's considered a really seminal book on the um, the understanding of the contemplative or the deepest mystical experience across all the traditions. That was a book that was called The Mystic Heart, mm -hmm. Discovering a Universal Spirituality in the World's Religions. Mm. And we began a international network for this discussion in 2002. And that's actually morphed into, among other things, a, a much larger group now that's called the Contemplative Alliance. Mm -hmm that if you looked at the list of people in the Contemplative Alliance, really kind of a who's who of contemplatives in Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, mm -hmm. again talking about what is the nature of this deepest exploration and what is found there that is in common uh, to the experience by everyone. Mm -hmm. So in the spiritual side, that, that journey for me has gone on from about 1969 mm -hmm. up until the present, doing what I'm doing now. Now in science, um, I actually had a uh, MA in, uh, in uh, biology before I went into the monastic life and then while I was, uh, was a Christian monk then I finished my PhD in uh, evolution systematics, comparative biology and um, ecology. And then I was at the American Museum of Natural History on their staff for 25 years in evolution and ecology and presently then my affiliations with the University of Florida what's called the McGuire Center for Tropical Biology. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in that context then with about 250 refereed journal articles, you know, I have a, that experience in mainstream science with the rigor of the scientific method and the purely objective discussion. So actually my interest, and I know it's also John's interest as well and yours from the train ride up here, is this mutual exploration of external space, I guess we could say, and internal space. Mm -hmm. And then the processing uh, within our species of what is there in that experience that allows the possibility for identifying some type of holistic experience that we're all having. That if we're actually an evolving species on an evolving planet, uh, at least the Vedic traditions now say that everything that's happening now is a continuation of the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Big Bang has gone through um, millions and billions of years of, of the evolution of material, and now it's going through an evolution in consciousness. And that evolution in consciousness, as inculcated in this particular intelligent species, Homo sapiens, is in a process of discovering how it can skillfully have some type of experience that is identified by everyone as a common experience and one that allows us to look at each other with divine value, with ultimate value, and, and possibly then could um, imply a different future for the world than just crashing and burning in competitiveness, resource starvation, war, pollution, everything else that's gone on in the planet now. So this, this is a journey that involves inquiry at the, at, the, at the most rigorous level of the external. That's what science is. Mm -hmm and then uh, inquiry at the most creative and hopefully communicative uh, realms of the internal uh, person, mm -hmm. and then discovering what that would look like for our species in the most skillful way. Now, just as one last anecdote then to that, that's why I'm interested in integral 
and spiral dynamics integral because there are at least two paradigmatic models that offer uh, the type of map that we that in which that could all be seen together. Mm -hmm. And I see that again as an unfolding of the evolutionary process toward, I guess you'd say, Homo sapiens coming of age. Kurt. So that's where I'm really mm -hmm. coming from. Did I um, hear you correctly when you said that the Vedic tradition holds that what's happening now is a direct result of the Big Bang, so that that would naturally pr preclude free will? Well, I think, well, I'd say this free will is a subset discussion because there are a lot of preconditions on how you would talk about free will. Whether you talk about it in a Western model, an Eastern model, a linear model, a nonlinear model. But I, to, to clarify your question, I'm referring specifically to the people at Sri Aurobindo Ashram and in Oroville in India which represent the tradition from Sri Aurobindo. Now I think you know that uh, Sri Aurobindo was the first great Vedic sage to say that this deepest internal exploration that we're having is not just about a transcendent experience, it's about a transcendent experience and an embodied experience. And the things that are learned in the transcendent, where that's destined to go is to be applied to every dimension of reality, cultures, politics. Now. Aurobindo, I think you know, was one of the leaders in the uh, revolution in India from the British. He wrote 20, 30 books on sociology and politics. He was a great scholar and a great mystic. He was also one of the first Vedic sages to have a companion who was known as the mother. And that was one of the first examples of the divine feminine and the divine masculine trying to find not only some voice together, but a mutual exploration together again speaking to the species that the future is a holistic one it's about the transcendent and about embodiment it's about the feminine and the masculine it's about every interdigitation between those and actually to go back to something you just said it, it, it actually would involve some very creative discussions about free will because I think if you look at the classic discussions of free will either in Western philosophy or in the East they're, they're a dynamic discussion that can't really land anywhere because they only land depending on your assumptions to begin with and what type of a system you're thinking in to begin with. Well, I mean, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, go ahead, John. Uh, I just want to add something um, because we've been talking about free will versus determinism. Um, but we also need to talk about the self. Um, and. I'm a little confused about what the self is. I think most people are. And one of my uh, outcomes is to get clarification about this very big topic. I think in philosophy and in science there's a great confusion. Uh, one of the things I wanted to offer is that there is a conventional notion of the self uh, where you can have free will or not have free will. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in the Eastern traditions there's a different way of thinking about the self and what the self means. And I'm, I'm calling this a post-conventional view of the self. And at that post-conventional view of the self, a cosmic self, uh, complete determinism would be equivalent to complete freedom. Mm, mm. Yeah, that, that's, so yeah, I think yeah. we need to move <coughs> from a, a conventional view of the self to a post-conventional view of the self. Yeah. What the self means is very different. All right, but yeah. Kurt, I wonder if you could add something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, you're pointing out a, a, a major paradox, and I just want to go back to a discussion that we had again on the train, that again, when I hear the term self, and I see that in a capital S, then I immediately then think of the Vedic traditions and the statement, you know, Atman is Brahman and Brahman is Atman. Or if you look at the Heart Sutra, formlessness is form, form is formlessness, never has it been otherwise, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. What that means actually out of the abstract is really this, is that the individual person, you know, uh, John, Nomi, Kurt, um, if we, when we plumb deeply enough in our deepest felt sense of reality, and this is what all the contemplatives report, we find a profound experience of interconnectedness mm -hmm. and a profound experience of seamlessness in which we've entered a dimension in which um, our sense of, of self is not distinguishable really except in a dynamic from what's going on with everything else. And we see an attribution of the value that's here with the value that's everywhere else. For instance, in Nisargadatta's book, I Am That, mm -hmm. the, the, the realization that, that I actually am 
the milieu. I actually am the, the littlest and the greatest. So the self in that sense then becomes really, I would say, that experience where the individual I has this profound experience of interconnectedness and in in then in 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 embracing that it implies something then about how every one of those eyes in that multiplicity is experiencing each other and then feeling about each other and then where they're acting from so that self then becomes that both it becomes that both here and there so you're saying that yeah so we don't really have a personal self per se it's really just one 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 system one universal system but then you were talking about like how you know in certain traditions there is like a being and a not being that coexist right, right however right. as a scientist yeah um, as a scientist um, we have to rely on fundamental truths yeah you know and just basic basic axioms um, that derive from from our experience from our perceptional right, so right. that within that context of whether it's the self that's um, that we feel is personal or that it's understood as a universal self the reality seems to be nonetheless that it is a causal experience that what happened at the Big Bang does determine what happens today so that so that the this feeling of free will yeah. it's it's quite ironic that um, that somehow the universe compelled us is compelling most of us humanity to have this this feeling but you know the a deeper understanding a more absolute understanding is that it is an illusion that really like what um, all this that we're doing right now has been is causal and has been predetermined there's there's a model here that's very very helpful that comes from a fellow used to be at City College named Stanley Salfa and it, it, it's the box within a box model boxes within boxes within boxes now if you think of just infinite boxes within boxes it allows both worlds that we're talking about because in those smaller boxes you're going to yes you're going to have measurable things things that actually meet the criteria of conventional science they're testable they're repeatable they're predictable and so on the minute you move to another box this is where quantum mechanics comes in the rules change a little bit right so you have a sliding scale reality between those kind of like fractal realities now we already take that for granted for instance when we send a space probe farther let's say than just our solar system when they do the geometry for the near-end planets they use Euclidean geometry when they get out farther they switch to Lobachevskian geometry so that they actually can take into account the curvature of space because of, of gravity so basically they're saying I'm going to change the criteria for my science because I realize that I'm going to a different box so if you can if you can kind of think within box within box within box and that's you know I, I have a question for you I, I've read Salty recently oh cool, uh, cool. he's really yeah. fascinating yeah. Um, and he uh, draws a lot from Charles Saunders Peirce and uh, of course Peirce thought that the universe is an exchange of signs so for there to be an exchange of signs there has to be an interpreter right absolutely so uh, yeah. I'm interested in yeah. this question of free will versus determinism right. well, what about the interpreter yeah and also yeah, yeah. we are an interpreter and we are interpreted absolutely. by the other signs absolutely. that we are connected to yeah, now yeah. Could, is there a relationship between that and the and the box within the box that you're talking about? yeah first I want to say that yeah the, the box within a box is a great tool but of course then you've got to also allow it to be seamless as well so you're, you as soon as you do boxes when boxes it's helpful but you're also limiting yourself so allow it to be boxes but also to have a continuum yeah but you're absolutely right there's not only observer and then what's observed and then what that creates but in the human narratives are the story and the storyteller now when we get into ideas of the ego mm -hmm. and the ego versus the cosmic self or let's say Eckhart Tolle's pain body which is the self that's suffering these are narratives or stories that are told by an observer and of course the big mistake as Eckhart Tolle points out in uh, Power of Now and a New Earth is that people mistake their story as reality mm -hmm. and they don't identify themselves as the creative storyteller who would have the option to switch stories at any moment you know so you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of frontiers mm -hmm. here that you're talking it, about it's sort of like the the distinction between the map and the territory absolutely and I think Wilbur uh, we're all a fan some of us are a fan of Wilbur's um, he said I thought something very suggestive that the 
the map is a performance by the territory because mm, mm, we tend mm, to mm, mm, sometimes uh, eat That's the menu well rather than eat the yeah. meal. We forget that our maps yeah. are performances yeah. by ourselves. Yeah, yeah because and they're not only individual narratives, but they're meta narratives. Now, culturally, this is again a thing we talk about a lot. The great cultural narratives, which box whole people in as far as cultural paradigms, religions, and, and the, the fears of rewards and punishments and end time scenarios that come with the traditional religions are really those meta narratives. And then the sad thing is, is that people on the individual level or even the collective level get trapped in those. And how many people are thinking outside that box? I mean, look at the Renaissance, look at any type of paradigm shift. Who are those people who actually moved outside the box? And sometimes at great peril. So right. So if we were designing the Bruno and Einstein, they absolutely. Can so if yeah. people <coughs> do have that ontological free will, why aren't they moving out of the box? Why is species stuck? Yeah. Well, again, I, I think you know, kind of the classic Vedic models h helpful again is that, you know, conditioning is a reality. I think mm -hmm. you guys have talked about this before in, in these discussions. Conditioning is a reality, and and then the question is, as we explore let's say the inner freedom of the self-inquiry of our subjective space starts to give us in that sense the courage which is interesting comes from the French word for heart to actually ask different questions now most people have started to ask different questions when at the deepest level of their experience the narrative of their, of their society did not satisfy them mm -hmm. didn't satisfy them in some really profound way and then, probably because of that, because that's an experience that backs you into a corner, and you, everyone's had these in your life. When you get backed into that corner, you start to ask a new set of questions. Mm -hmm. And that que those questions may then predict a different set of boxes that's actually being mm -hmm. looked at. And it may mean boxes that you yourself create, if you're the pioneer like Einstein, or boxes that you discover, like if you latch on to Wilbur or you latch on to Don Beck, you find that someone else done some creative thinking where you go, oh, wow, you know, that really works for me. Thank God someone else invented that wheel. I don't have to invent it over again. Mm -hmm. But then you can jump right there. But we're in, a, in, an, in an involving system. And the point is the conditioning holds back that evolution. And this is where there's a big straddle again, because that's exactly the way natural evolution is. It's, a, it's, it's a based on the bell curves of population genetics. Wherever that norm is, that's going to tend to hold what a species looks like, what it looks like in its adaptive complexes and its traits. They're going to be centered around that mean. Mm -hmm. So that's true for living organisms the same way it's true for cultures. Mm -hmm. You could make a bell curve for Islamic thought. You could make a bell curve for, let's say, fundamentalist Christian thought. And you could characterize the narratives that box people in along that mean and then the different variations on that, you know, out toward people who are thinking more creatively. And more creatively, and that simply would be they're in the minority. All right, Kurt, mm -hmm. now, but you say that some people, you know, transcend the, con the conditioning. But wouldn't that transcendence be conditioned? Because, you know, if we... Totally, it, so, always. Right, yeah. so that, that's, that's the, the, it's a the point. Degree. So whether, yeah. whether we see ourselves as a, a personal self or a, a universal self, yeah. as a transcendent being or being, you know, stuck within the conventional reality, yeah. that, it's, it's all causal. Yeah. So, Nomi, you were referring to the idea of, of the, um, you know, free will from, from which perspective? The, um, you used the word the um, omni, or I used the word post-conventional. I don't know if that was the no, no. Word. In today's discussion, yes, yeah. Well, just um, yeah, like w I mean, when Kurt was saying that, you know, there is this, uh, there is this mean that people are attracted to in any particular culture. I mean, which applies to seculars as well. I Absolutely, mean, they are also stuck yeah. in that mean. Yeah, science, science itself is is centered around a methodological approach, right. which is a very very strict mean. Right. And even this was the difficulty in accepting quantum mechanics mm -hmm. because it was going to violate uh, certain means that were actually considered cognitive. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you, that th things could not be this and that at the same right. time. Right. 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 right, right, right. So that's a good example, yeah. So do you, you do want to uh, talk about the paradox because, you know, I mean, I think in our discussion the word paradox usually mm -hmm. comes when, when we're talking about free will and determinism. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, can we say that it, it's, it's neither free will nor determinism? Certainly in the, in, in, in the tradition of the great wisdom traditions, it's always both and. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's never trying to decide and either nor. And neither, and, uh, and, and neither nor, and I absolutely, yeah. But yeah, right, mm -hmm. all right, you have the traditions, right? 
But then, like, I know, for, like, from Buddhism, there's, like, the conventional reality and the absolute reality. Conventional right. reality is that which we accept, we build our civilization on, and that kind of, like, accepts free will, th because that's, that's our perception. Right. But then the absolute reality recognizes that perception is mistaken, mm -hmm. because it has no though, though it also says that they are not two. See, it's, mm -hmm. it, we, we almost have to distinguish between saying they're one. It's better to say they're not two. Actually, classical Buddhism classical Vedism says not to. The word Advaita actually means not to. So sometimes a lot of the, the sages say, no, we're, we're not talking about exact, we're not talking about oneness because that's homogenization. But we're talking about not to-ness uh -huh. and what that means to be in a dynamic play all the time. Uh -huh. And the word paradox itself means two things of equal glory. It doesn't mean contradiction. It means two things of equal glory. And it's asking can we live in a milieu of understanding that allows all of that to be true? And that's generally why in the mystical traditions and in the contemplative uh, uh, traditions, um, I lost my train of thought. Can I add something to that uh, yeah. or ask a question? If we imagine that we have a circle, yeah. and we have a line that divides it into A and to B, we can travel across that line so we can have an experience of A, an experience of B, right. a memory of A when we're in B, a memory right. of, of B when we're in A. Right. So it's both B and A. Right. And then there's the line which is neither contained yeah. or not contained. Or not contained. Because the line makes for the division, yeah. but it also transcends and includes it. Right, and it's a box that's been built by a, a storyteller. Right. And the train of thought uh, that, 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 that I had lost is that, it, that the, the great traditions will say, this, this is why this can't be understood by the mind. Right. It right. can only be understood by consciousness. Because the mind is a tool of separation and is a parsing tool. Mm -hmm. And the mind itself and language mm -hmm. and storytelling mm -hmm. by its nature creates one thing and another thing. But consciousness, and this is pretty much why they talk about this journey of the the subjective inquiry, the contemplative journey, is to experience in consciousness, which holds it anyway, and let's maybe throw the word consciousness out, to experience in the totality of the quantum field that which holds it all and allows both things to be true without a problem. Now the claim by all contemplatives is that when they have that awakening, they came to a, an understanding in consciousness that there was no contradiction here. But to write about it is very, very difficult. They either have to write in paradoxical language, right. or as you said on the train, in metaphor, yeah. and very skillful metaphor. Can I add something to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, because a lot of contemplatives talk about the pure consciousness event, right, right. Um, which transcends and includes all phenomena. Uh, in our Western tradition, phenomenology is focusing on consciousness of, intentional, uh, and we're so uh, obsessed with consciousness of. But this pure consciousness event is uh, metaphorized in various ways, in right. some very creative ways, right. which is very suggestive to us. For example, I think Meister Eckhart talked about the bolt inside the hinge and the door that opens and closes. Right. Um, Ibn Arabi talks about ocean without a shore. Right. Um, also, uh, I think there's a, a philosopher, I think his name is a Kaufman, I, I might be wrong, but he talked about a satellite dish, mm. a very contemporary mm. metaphor. It's a satellite dish that picks up radar once in a while, but it's on 24-7. And that's very hard for our phenomenal uh, consciousness of selves to imagine that there is a consciousness which is awake 24-7. Yeah. Uh, and I think the, the, that pure consciousness event however, is available to everyone if you want to cultivate that. Right, and it's, and it's usually described, and I think this is really important, as an experience that was labelless, labelless. Right. It was categoryless. that someone finally had a moment where they weren't in the milieu of identifying. And when they were no longer in the milieu of identifying, they were no longer in a small box, they suddenly were in this naturally existing true nature, Buddha nature, Christ consciousness, big box that saw things without labels and said, whoa, right. I actually can see this all at once. Right. Consciousness can see it 
and even more important, heart can see it. But is there even a box at that level? No, no, absolutely There's not. There's no That's edges the whole at all. Point. Kurt, how, yeah. how would um, civilization transcending the illusion of free will um, enhance or um, kind of um, hasten this kind of evolution of our um, mm -hmm. species? I think what's generally talked about is that where we would probably be evolving is to a creature in which the term they use is resonance, that there was a skill in the reading of resonance between so-called individual beings or, or boxes. That when I'm having this discussion with you in a future world where there might not be war, and your highest interest would also be my highest interest, and my highest concern would be your well-being and my well-being, that would be a species that is listening to a resonance from a divine, from a creature of ultimate value to a creature of ultimate value, from a seer of ultimate value to a seer right. of ultimate so how value. Does, how does and that would be the currency for relationships. And that's very to um, an interior. Absolutely. Right. Not just looking at the Ab exterior. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. How, absolutely. Does, how does then yeah. the, um, the illusion of free will prevent that? What, what does the, that illusion do, do to kind of like you know, just like not allow us to, to reach that. I think it, it's, it's real simple because it comes from the idea that there's an individual to begin with, which is the whole Eastern story and Eckhart Tolle story of, of, of ego. As soon as you think you're something separate from something else, it predicts a certain type of discussion, which is a different discussion than the one we're talking about, mm -hmm. you know. Can I, can I offer a quotation here? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to talk about this later. Um, but it just seems to pop out right now. We've this got is 11 seconds. Yes. Oh, sorry. Or can, can you read it in 11 sure. seconds? Thus, we cannot escape the fact that the world we know is constructed in order to see itself. But in order to do so, evidently, it must cut itself up into at least one state which sees and at least one other state which is seen. That's All right, guys, we got to go. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>